Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Um, today I'm going to go through a little mini lecture on our lab from week two. Um, I was unable to record the lectures while we were in lab, so I'm just going to make a short video uh, hitting the key topics so that you have a, another reference point. Okay, so we started off by talking about how to break down movements. Um, <clears throat> first, we start by breaking down our exercises into the phases of the movement. Um, so in most cases with resistance training exercises, they are broken down into the moving phase, the resisting or lowering phase, and the um, transitions in between or the points where an object is held in place. These correspond with our three muscle actions. So there is a concentric portion, a lifting portion where the muscles are shortening and creating enough force to overcome the resistance. During the eccentric phase, the muscles are controlling movement or lowering movement back to its previous position or going with gravity or with the resistance. And then the isometric phase is in between the concentric and eccentric phases. Um, so for example, the um, bench press, we would start in an isometric position where the elbows are extended we will go through an eccentric phase where it lowers the resistance down to the um, lifter's chest. There's an isometric transition where the bar stops moving and then begins to lift in the concentric phase. Okay, so we'll, we're, we're working through each phase because the phase will de determine the muscle contraction type as well as um, which muscles are working within that action. Okay, for, for cyclical exercises, we won't go into these today. Um, cyclical exercises are things like running, rowing, swimming, walking, um, cycling, um, where there's no real concentric, eccentric, concentric, eccentric, biphasic action. Um, these are often um, where you are propelling yourself forward. So more of the focus is on um, absorbing force and creating force or continuing to create um, some kind of acceleration rather than kind of in place, up and down, forward, backward, like we see in most resistance training exercises. So for example, here we have running where there's the touchdown phase, which is where the foot makes contact with the ground. There's the loading phase where the body begins to absorb the force of the runner going towards the ground. Then there's the propulsion phase where they begin to push off. Early swing where their leg kicks back in the air mid swing when it's coming forward and late swing when it's coming down to hit the ground again to start another cycle of that movement. Okay, today we're just going to work on traditional biphasic exercises that have the concentric and eccentric portion. And then we start to look at um, how we are going to assess the torque demands on the joint. So which joints are involved, how much torque is being placed on that joint, which is going to determine how much muscle recruitment we're going to need in order to perform that movement. The plane dictates the viewing angle. Um, so sagittal plane movements are viewed from the side. Frontal plane movements are viewed from the front or the back. Um, and then transverse plane movements are, are viewed from a diagonal or preferably a top angle, so a top-down view. The joints involved is our next point of emphasis. So we look at, okay, this is a sagittal plane movement. So we're going to look at it from either the right side or the left side. We're going to look at the joints that are causing movement. What are the movements they are performing? Which muscle actions are being performed during this phase of the movement that I'm viewing? Therefore, which muscles are performing those actions to control or cause those movements at those joints within that plane. Um, so it works us either way. Once we can figure out all of that information, we have a very, a very broad grasp of that exercise and what's going on. Okay, but first of all, movements are caused or resisted by muscles. Um, so this is the, the primary emphasis of resistance training. We are causing our muscles to cause or resist some kind of resistance or acceleration or momentum. Okay. 
if we're going to break down these movements, we need to know the movement pattern first before we can assess which muscles are involved or which joints are involved. And now that we know which movement, we know that the movements have to be influenced by muscles in some way, we want to train movement for our um, clients or our athletes in the field of strength and conditioning um, because athletes use movements to execute tasks. They don't use muscles. Muscles are just kind of those, the background worker to achieve the movement task. Okay. And then if we're looking to train the muscles individually, muscles will be trained based on movement selection and execution. So um, specific exercises will train muscles and how we perform the exercise, the execution, will determine how they will be trained. Um, so just saying that we're doing a glute exercise or a quadricep exercise doesn't give us the whole picture because we don't know the execution and we don't know the movement pattern that's being trained. We just know that there's a muscle that has to be used in this exercise. We'll get into later in this class how execution is key when it comes to training our body to perform a task or even to just train a muscle to increase its size or increase its individual motor control or strength. So we'll start off with the barbell back squat as our first example. We'll go through our five point checklist to kind of understand this muscle. Okay. We have to look first which plane of movement. Okay, it's a sagittal plane movement because we're looking at it from the side. And we can see that the movements themselves at the joints, we have the hip, the knee, and the ankle joint. They're performing flexion at the hip, flexion at the knee, dorsiflexion at the ankle. If we're lowering this weight down, he likely didn't start in this position, so he's probably moving himself down towards the ground. That would be an eccentric muscle action, which means that my opposing muscle groups to the movement will be the ones recruited. So if there is an eccentric knee flexion, I need to use my opposing muscle group, the knee extensor group, to overcome or resist the movement that's being performed eccentrically. So it's a sagittal plane movement, primarily training the hip, knee, and ankle musculature, performing hip flexion, knee flexion, and dorsiflexion. If we're looking strictly at the bottom phase, it is isometric, so we're resisting going into more flexion because that barbell is trying to create a flexion torque on our body. It's trying to cause these joints to move into more flexion. So we need to use our extensor groups to resist that flexor torque. So we use our extensor muscle groups to create extensor torques at the joint to counteract the flexion torque from the external resistance. And now we need to know where torque is being placed. We need to understand how, how do we find where torque is being placed. First of all, we know that torque is a force applied a distance away along a lever from an axis of rotation that causes a turning effect. So it's a rotary force. It causes um, points to turn. The hip, knee, and ankle joints are points of rotation or axes of rotation. The limbs are levers. So um, thinking the trunk as one segment, the thigh, um, the shank, or the shin, and the foot as segments, that torque is being applied a distance away from that segment and it is causing rotation around the axis of rotation which is the joint. Muscles also are applied a distance away from that joint center at their insertion point which causes a torque or a turning effect, a turning force at the joint. And we see here that there's torque being placed on the hip, the knee, and the ankle because that bar is being applied a distance away from those joint centers. So it's not straight through the joint, it's off axis or, or further away from the joint, which is going to cause a turning effect at that joint, or in this case, a flexion torque at the joint. Where is the most torque being placed? Well, we need to remember first that torque is the product of the 
moment arm length, and the force applied. So the moment arm length is the perpendicular distance between the applied force and the axis of rotation. So this is an imaginary lever that is at a 90 degree angle to the force being applied. You can see them here at the hip, knee, and ankle. I have them shown for you as a visual. Where is the most torque being placed? Well, if the barbell weight is consistent, okay, the barbell weight isn't changing, the joint with the largest moment arm will have the most torque, in this case, the hip, which means that the hip joint musculature, the hip extensor group, is going to have to produce a larger counter torque in order to lift up the resistance. Okay. And this barbell is causing a flexor torque. My hip extensors are causing a hip extension torque. Even if that hip extension torque is less than the flexor torque, if it's less, then the bar will fall or go towards the ground. My hip extensor torque is greater than the barbell's flexor torque. I will lift the weight up. And now we can compare two different variations of the squatting exercise. What are the major differences here? I see they're primarily the moment arm lengths between the joints. So the barbell is placed um, on the front of the shoulders for the front squat, on the back of the shoulders for the back squat. So we're not changing bar position very much, um, just the, the distance from the front to back of the shoulders. But what does this do to the moment arm length? Well, first of all, it changes the torso angle, which is going to change the position of the hip joint. So if we see here, looking at these two visuals, in the back squat, there's a much larger moment arm to the hip. And in the front squat, there's a much larger moment arm to the knee, comparing the two face-to-face, -face, um, assuming that the resistance is the same and they're very similar at the ankle joint. Okay, so that moment arm length is going to change <clears throat> the muscle recruitment because in the front squat, the torque is pretty evenly distributed between the hip and the knee musculature. In the back squat, it's more um, catered towards the hip musculature, less towards the knee musculature. Um, so in order to counteract the torque the barbell's creating on the body, in the back squat, the hip extensors need to perform more work in the front squat, the knee extensors will have to perform more work compared to the back squat. Okay, remember this because the moment arm is a perpendicular distance between the application of force and the joint center. So we're looking at that distance that creates a right angle to the applied force. Um, I draw a force line going directly down to, to show gravity, and we can use that to show us our distances. And this is important because the moment arm length directly impacts the torque applied on the joint because torque is equal to the force times the moment arm length. So if moment arm length increases, torque will increase regardless of the force being applied. Okay, this is more, um, this is what we're going to look at for these external torques because we know the internal torques stay, or the internal moment arms stay relatively the same within an individual. They're slightly different between people, but you're not going to be able to change your muscle's insertion point. Okay, that's a natural um, piece. You're, you're born that way, you can't change that. So um, for the internal torque, we're looking at increasing the force that the muscle is producing to change the torque. Um, as opposed to the external resistance, we can manipulate the force applied using more or less resistance and the moment arm length by how we position that resistance compared to the center of the joint. Okay, and how does this influence muscle improve or muscle involvement? If there's a larger torque at a joint, the opposing muscle groups at that joint will have to produce more force. If we compare those squatting movements to a deadlift movement, um, where the, the force is being applied relatively towards the same point on the body, so that barbell is, is just hanging from the arms, but in the similar position to where the barbell would be positioned in the back squat. So the lever length for the torso is relatively the same. However, the joint angles are very different. The knee is in a more extended position. 
the hip is in a more flexed position and the moment arm to the hip is extremely large while the moment arm to the knee is very small. This is going to make this movement much more dominant towards the posterior chain or the hip extensors as opposed to the front squat movement, which is distributed equally between the two, between the, uh, the knee and the hip extensor muscles. If we look at another movement like the overhead press, okay, here from the starting position of an overhead press, we notice that we have to view it from the frontal plane because the shoulders are performing abduction or an abduction torque while the barbell is trying to place an adduction torque on the shoulder joint. So to oppose that, um, that counter torque that the barbell is producing, we have to produce an abduction torque to lift the barbell up. Throughout the overhead press movement, that moment arm is going to change throughout any exercise. The moment arm length changes depending on the joint range of motion. So as he lifts that barbell up higher and higher, the moment arm is going to get longer and longer and then shorter and shorter. Somewhere in the mid range of the movement will be the largest moment arm for the shoulder joint. Normally that is the point within the resistance training exercise where um, the individual will have the most trouble because the, the torque has been increased at the joint, which means that the muscle has to increase its torque output. If it can't handle the torque of the external resistance, you're unable to lift or complete that exercise movement. Okay, looking at our last one here, we're looking at a lunge or a split squat position. This is where we have to look at not just gravity being applied, but also the ground reaction force that is applied to the body. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's Newton's third law. So as gravity is pushing down on this individual's center of mass, this individual also has to push into the ground to lift their center of mass, okay, or to resist it from falling down faster. Because his limbs are not directly beneath his center of mass, He's not going to produce a directly upwards counter torque or counter force. <clears throat> it's going to be at an angle because he's pushing slightly at an angle with each of those limbs to sum his forces to counteract gravity. So when we're analyzing movements, we need to look at not just gravity placed on this individual or on the exercise, but also the ground reaction force that's being applied back onto the individual when they push onto the ground. Okay, so however hard this individual pushes into the ground, the ground will push back on them with an equal and opposite force. Okay, we can determine the torque at that joint based on the ground reaction force applied, multiplied by the moment arm length or the force times the perpendicular distance from the force to the axis of rotation, which will allow us to see which joints are experiencing more or less torque throughout the exercise. All right, thank you for watching and I'll see you next lab.